Trump um, over the last 10 days. And the Wilson Center, um, like many other think tanks, um, has really uh, given quite a lot of thought about what the new administration means, not just for you, the United States domestically, but also um, on the international front. We actually held an event earlier this week uh, to talk about what the world actually expects for the new administration in the coming years. But this is actually our first um, opportunity to delve at one particular relationship, the US-Japan relationship. And I believe we're actually one of the first um, think tanks to do so. And there's no doubt that it is a timely topic uh, given that uh, President-elect Trump will be meeting with uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe at 5 o'clock today at Trump Tower. Mm -hmm. So um, I almost want to have it up on the screen as, <laughs> as we go along so we could read the body language and interpret um, what's going on. But perhaps um, given my own background as a financial journalist, I often look at market responses to current events. And the market response to Trump um, after an, an initi initial sell-off has been very welcoming. And it seems at first blush that for um, global investors at least, Trump's America is a buy, at least for now. But when we look at it from a foreign policy perspective, um, there is great anxiety. And how he envisions Washington's relations with Tokyo is still um, uncertain. And the, what he has said in the campaign trail um, has caused a lot of anxiety in Tokyo. Um, the calls for greater financial contribution from the Japanese for the US-Japan Security Alliance has certainly caused a lot of uh, angst. Uh, Trump's opposition to TPP, calling Japan a currency manipulator, and the rally to have more protectionist measures to deal with trade imbalances has certainly also been a factor of great concern for the Japanese. But today, I'm hoping that instead of speculating the outlook for the United States as a Pacific power, we can actually spend time on how Japan sees itself in, the, in light of not only the change that is, will be coming in the United States, um, but how, what role it can play in ensuring regional stability and achieving a common bilateral objective. It's true that does, r whether or not Trump is president or not, there are common, there are underlying threats not least the possibility or prospects of a North Korean nuclear threat. There's also political instability in South Korea. And there's uncertainty also about um, policy in Asia. But is this an opportunity for Japan to take on a greater role in promoting security and stability and prosperity? I'm really excited today to be able to introduce two people who would really shed light on these um, topics. One is um, Shingo Yamagami, who is the Acting Director General of the Japan Institute for International Affairs. The other is Jeffrey Horning, the, a fellow for the Security and Foreign, uh, Foreign Affairs Program at Sasaka USA. You have your fl his, their full bios in front of you, and I'm going to ask Mr. Yamagami to start the discussion. Well, uh, thank you, Shihoko-san. And, uh, well, it's uh, interesting to note that uh, what you just, uh, you know, remarked, uh, you know, uh, uh, sounds very similar to, you know, most of the response uh, I have, you uh, know, uh, listened to and uh, heard uh, in Tokyo. Uh, frankly speaking, I think uh, many in Japan are surprised to see, you know, the turn of events. There have been a lot of, uh, you know, prediction that, uh, you know, the other candidate would uh, probably win. So as far as, uh, you know, upset was concerned, uh, we do share, you know, your surprise. Uh, that said, uh, yes, uh, there is a, you know, certain degree of uh, anxiety uh, as to what you mentioned 
unpredictability of the you know new administration to come uh, especially you know during the you know election campaigns uh, the vocabulary or you know lexicon of 1970s or 1980s you know seem to have come back such as you know free rider or unfair trade practice or currency manipulator and uh, you know uh, some in the asia uh, pacific uh, might have wondered naturally that whether the united states no allies from adversaries so uh, there is uh, i think a lot of uh, you know uh, mending fences uh, to be made under the new new administration as has been pointed out by you know shihoko san uh, we are facing a lot of challenges in east asia not to speak of uh, you know nuclear weapons development program you know uh, by north korea or aggressive you know maritime behavior uh, both in the south china sea east china sea so we cannot waste you know any time you know between allies now it's high time for us to you know reinforce and further strengthen our alliance uh, between the united states and japan in terms of facing up to you know those challenges any schism or uh, you know any power vacuum is you know uh, there to be taken advantage of by our you know counterparts uh, i think the history of uh, paracel islands scarborough shore or spratry island all you know demonstrate the importance of not creating any power <coughs> vacuum Secondly, uh, I would like to you know, mention the importance of uh, TPP. Of course, you know, I'm fully aware that TPP is really unpopular nowadays here in, you know, inside the Beltway, but this is a significant achievement made you know, by joint, joint cooperation between US and Japan. Uh, in terms of trade liberalization and rules making in investment and trade, it is really unprecedented. Not only that, you know, this has significance as a strategic endeavor for us to work together for our common, common goals. Without the US, TPP wouldn't go forward, but what could be more worrisome is, you know, with the absence of the United States, that vacuum could well be filled up by some other country, or trade deal could go on without the participation of the United States. So now is uh, you know a high time for us to you know uh, renew our efforts and shed light on the importance of this agreement. Finally, uh, you know, let me mention the importance of you know, uh, striking a personal and working relationship at the level of uh, you know, leaders and at the level of uh, civil servants as well. Uh, Prime Minister Abe and his administration did not waste any time in coming up this idea of you know, Prime Minister stopping by New York City you know, in his way to attend APEC summit meeting in Peru. <coughs> this is Japan's endeavors to try to, you know, uh, further cooperate uh, with the United States on various issues of mutual interest. Uh, I don't expect uh, not too much uh, specifics to come out from this meeting, but I'm sure this is going to be a good, good step forward. So with that, uh, I will stop here. Thank you, Shihoku. Thank you. Um, before I turn to um, Jeffrey, if I if I may, um, I agree with the importance of TPP. But as you pointed out, it is a very uh, highly politically divisive issue, and it's very unlikely that the United States would move ahead and ratify TPP. There is a lot of speculation on the Hill at the moment that perhaps there could be a U.S.-Japan bilateral trade agreement based on the agreements of TPP. 
would that be in Japan's interest? Or if not, why not? Well, it is true that uh, you know a uh, significant you know factor uh, or merits of this TPP is Japan U.S. FTA, but uh, Japan U.S. FTA is not the whole picture of you know TPP. We have regulations on investment, you know investment liberalization. We have new, you know, rules set on state enterprise and so on. So it's, you know, far wider than mere, you know, bilateral FTA. More importantly, we have other, you know, nations in Asia Pacific involved, including important players in Southeast Asia, Oceania, South America. That makes the merits of, you know, TPP uh, farther, farther bigger, and uh, so suppose if you know United States give up on this idea of TPP, already there is an work on RCEP going on. RCEP is a trade agreement between ten members of ASEAN and six outside members, including Japan, and uh, China. So who will take the leadership? in terms of trade liberalization, rules making in the Asia Pacific? I think that is a question rightly posed to American leadership right now. Thank you. Jeffrey. Yes. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's uh, obviously a very timely topic. Um, so as, as was already uh, said, the the election, uh, the victory of, of Donald Trump has put a lot of Asian countries on sort of high alert uh, because of the surprise. Um, and as I'm sure most of you are aware, there's been a lot of gloom and doom analysis of what this means for pick your country or, or pick American foreign policy. But I guess when I, when I thought about this today, uh, what, what to sort of say, uh, I think, first of all, we need to remind ourselves that it's a little too early to know what President Trump will do versus candidate Trump. Um, you have a lot of domestic actors. You have uh, international events uh, that will all have an effect on what the actual policy becomes. Um, but at the same time, I think that the campaign rhetoric does give us a general sense of the parameters uh, within which that uh, he may want to take American foreign policy. And so with that, I, I just looking at the U.S.-Japan alliance and specifically from a security standpoint, um, there's a number of things that I think we can, we can uh, sort of look at. And my objective is to lay out possible best case scenarios. Uh, there's enough gloom and doom analysis out there and it's not constructive. Uh, I think it's, it's good to try to look at, okay, where going forward. Uh, to do that, I just want to briefly remind a couple of uh, sort of his thoughts on a number of issues that he raised during the campaign um, on potential rivals and challengers to the U.S. Um, he has said that he wants to live peacefully and in friendship with China and Russia. He wants to ease tension specifically, uh, improve relations with Russia, and he's also indicated a willingness to talk to Kim Jong-un, uh, the leader of North Korea. On the military, U.S. military, he wants to make U.S. military dominance unquestioned. So he essentially wants to pour a lot of money in and build up the U.S. military. On the U.S.-Japan Japan alliance itself, he has questioned the value of the security treaty uh, in terms of Japan not paying near what it costs. And that was already uh, referred to at the beginning. Um, and he's repeated this, uh, this talk or this, this idea that Japan, South Korea, others are not paying their fair share. Uh, in the alliance, and that he has also said he wants to call together a summit of all U.S. alliances or allies to discuss rebalancing financial commitments as well as new strategies to deal with common challenges. Uh, he has suggested that Japan should uh, get nuclear weapons to protect itself. And on the South China Sea, he has, with China, he has talked a lot about economic issues. When he does talk about security issues, he did. Um, say that he would be willing to use trade as a leverage to negotiate China's position in the South China Sea. 
So this is just a reminder of some of the things that he said. So what does that translate into then? Um, the dominant narrative that we see on the U.S.-Japan alliance uh, has been that this results in the greatest challenge to the alliance ever, bar none. This is it. Um, but if we flesh out the policies, potential policies that result from this thinking, it's not exactly clear to me that that dominant narrative holds up in terms of this being a great challenge. Um, so let me lay out some of these potential best case scenarios for, from the security standpoint. Um, but first, yes, we should expect challenges. This is not going to be completely a, a cakewalk. As, as uh, Yamagami-san said, this unpredictability of the next administration has um, caused a lot of uncertainty in the alliance. Uh, it, as, as Yamagami-san rightly said, all this talk of free ride and currency manipulation, this is all 1980s Japan. And from the Jap Japanese standpoint, it really sort of drilled home the, this idea that Trump doesn't know what he's talking about when it comes to the alliance or doesn't appreciate uh, the aspect. And so this, this will continue to remain an issue uh, in terms of uh, uncertainty. Um, but I think there's also potential challenges stemming from uh, his approach to China. Maybe not, but maybe. If you look at over the last six years or so, Japan and the U.S. have struggled to come up with a common approach to China. There's been frictions on sort of their, their threat perceptions of China. And although uh, Trump on the campaign trail has said some very sh uh, harsh things about China, he's also uh, not spoken in depth really about the security aspects, which are the most troubling aspects from the Japanese standpoint. And so how he does uh, approach China as president, I think, will determine uh, some uh, potential challenges with Japan. If he takes a compliant approach with China, completely compliant approach, uh, this could upset relations with Tokyo, stemming from fears of sort of strategic abandonment. Uh, if he takes a middling approach, sort of what we've seen in the last couple of years, where kind of hard, kind of soft, um, you're going to get essentially status quo with what we have with U.S.-Japan in regards to China. But if he takes a tougher approach with China, that actually could reassure Tokyo and lead to uh, some, uh, some uh, pluses in the relationship. But beyond these tr challenges, uh, I do think that there's a potential to have, a Trump administration has the potential to have a minimum negative impact on the alliance. And here's why. You look at a number of things from the Japanese perspective. First of all is Russia, with what he has said with Russia. As many of you know, um, the Japan, Mi Prime Minister Abe in uh, particular, his uh, desire to sign a peace treaty with President Putin and try to deal with the Northern Territories, it's been a big source of friction with the United States. Um, and if things develop along a friendly trajectory with Russia and the United States, this is a plus for Japan and Japan and Russia because it takes that friction out and, and, and ha Mr. Abe can pursue better relations and more cooperative uh, um, possibilities without the fear of U.S. reprisal. And it also p could pay dividends in terms of Russia cooperation on North Korea uh, or uh, new geopolitical options for Russia in the Asia Pacific beyond just China. So there are some pluses that could come from that if uh, positive relations do develop between Russia and the United States. The second is alliance coordination. If the United States actually sat down and called together all its global allies, like treaty allies, this is a good thing. This is actually, you could have U.S. allies sitting down, talking together how they could address common threats like North Korea or ISIS and talk about what they're willing to do, what they're willing to bring to the table. The, this is all assuming, though, that the discussion about greater burden sharing does not take the dominant, uh, the dominant theme in these talks, because if it comes down to you need to pay 4%, you need to pay 2%, then it's going to break down. But if you actually have a discussion on common challenges and what allies can do and how they can cooperate, I think that's a plus. Uh, and from Japan, it's good because Japan has been trying to cooperate more with a lot of U.S. allies. Um, a third uh, aspect is the importance of Japan to U.S. strategy in Asia. Regardless of what replaces the rebalance strategy, uh, it's clear that uh, once it's clear that the new administration sees Japan as strategically vital as an ally and as a power projection base, uh, Japan's right back in the center of its strategic importance to U.S. strategy in Asia. Um, it might not be smooth, 
there's probably going to be challenges along the way when they start talking about burden sharing uh, and stuff like that. But I guess the thing that I'm hopeful here is candidate Trump never questioned the value of alliances themselves. He's not opposed to alliances. What he's looked at him is largely in terms of a transactional cost. They're not paying enough. If we want them as an ally, they need to do more. And so I'm a little hopeful there that because he doesn't oppose alliances per se, that uh, once uh, the realities of, uh, of the challenges that Yamagami-san uh, uh, talked about in, in the region, once that's clear and the need for power projection, that Japan's uh, strategic value will be abundantly clear. Um, and, then, and then finally, or uh, actually my second to last point is this actually gives a chance for Abe to expand. Um, He's been talking a lot since coming into power about uh, proactive contributions to peace. Uh, I, it's, I've been a little skeptical because there's not been a lot of there there. There's been more rhetoric there than actual policies there. Um, and so if now, if, if Japan is not able or willing to pay more as an ally uh, monetarily for U.S. forces, then the next question from President Trump will be, what can you do then? What more can you do? And given that uh, Japan put pressure on the U.S. to sign new defense guidelines and they revised security legislation domestically, there's a lot more that Japan can do now legally. And so it would not be beyond a President Trump to say, let's do some more. And Japan could possibly take on a greater regional security provider role as opposed to just a security user. Um, and this would be a good thing because it would start to flesh out the rhetoric of Abe in terms of proactive contributions to peace. And then uh, the final aspect would be Fatemma, everyone's favorite issue when it comes to security relations. Um, the good news here is that it's unlikely President Trump is ever going to raise this as an issue. Unless a Prime Minister Abe said, we want to change uh, our direction with Fatemma, it's highly unlikely this is going to bubble up to the level of uh, Trump in his, upon coming into office as a priority. And it, with a Supreme Court ruling or something, a, le a, a judicial action uh, expected sometime early next year, it's highly unlikely this is going to change either. So at the end of the day, I think that when you, when you think about it, President Trump coming in and all the things he's put on his agenda, global issues being more like nuclear nonproliferation um, or even uh, ISIS, domestic agendas. When you think about all those things and you think about the fact that U.S.-Japan alliance right now has no outstanding challenges or issues, the fact of the matter is Japan is not going to be on a top priority list in terms of let's change these policies, let's do a lot of different things. And so the status quo, I think, is actually going to hold for a while, and it actually could be beneficial uh, to Japan in some ways. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, th thank you for that, Jeffrey. Your comment about um, Japan, the possibility of Japan um, becoming more of a provider uh, and not simply a user on the security front is, is very poignant, I think. And I wanted to ask Yamagami-san, whether you agree with that assessment, and if so, how can Japan do so? And this will this further the domestic debate within Japan about further not simply reinterpretation of the pacifist constitution, but uh, well, uh, first of all, you know, with due respect to my friend Jeffrey, you know, uh, I think I have to take issue, you know, with the word security user. Uh, because you know Japan has been providing a lot of indispensable logistical first you know logistical support to US forces in Japan if you talk to you know US Navy men you know some are you know are ready to admit that uh, for example maintenance work provided to US aircraft carrier in Yokosuka in Sasebo could even excel the quality of services provided within the United States. Or if you talk about Cold War experience, Japan was indispensable in you know, improving under our anti-submarine warfare ASWs. So in that regard, you know, there was uh, 
maybe you know in your perception small con contribution but certainly you know uh, we have been playing a certain role and uh, in that regard you know uh, we have been uh, contributing in terms of uh, providing uh, security if you talk with uh, Southeast Asian, you know, many of them uh, would uh, readily admit that uh, this alliance between the U.S. and Japan has been, uh, you know, regional and global commons. Mm -hmm. That has been a stabilizer of regional security in Asia. So, uh, you know, in those regards, yes, uh, you know, we have been enjoying security you know, provided by extended nuclear, you know, extended de deterrence of the United States. But uh, at the same time, we have been playing, Japan has been playing a certain role. Uh, on another, you know, uh, point of, you uh, know, security issues, I quite agree with Jeffrey when he said, you know, not many security issues uh, were discussed uh, during the course of presidential elections. It is true that China was, you know, uh, talked about only from the, you know, viewpoint of, uh, you know, trade and investment, not necessarily from national security uh, viewpoint. Uh, in that regard, you know, under the new administration, uh, we could do a lot by comparing notes and, you know, realigning, you know, our you know, mutual policies vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, uh, this particular, you know, country, which is the cause of uh, a lot of concern in the Asia you know, Pacific. We, you point out, Yamagami-san, that on the campaign trail, Trump has been very, uh, hasn't really talked about China as a security threat. He has really seen China as a, an, an economic rival. And he has accused China of being a currency manipulator. And in actual fact, it's, it's um, the manipulation has been so that it actually increases the value of the renminbi. And anything to do away with that would actually be to the detriment of the United States. Um, Trump has also suggested a um, levying of 35 45% tariffs on Chinese goods that could actually backfire on the United States as it increases the cost of um, imports into the United States. Trump, as a businessman, as a non-traditional politician, I believe is very pragma pragmatic. And if he does label China as an economic rival, what kind of, what impact would that have on U.S.-Japan relations does that make it does that make it more difficult for Japan to deal with the United States? Do, does that hardline approach to China upset um, the economic ties between the two countries, or can they be separate? Well, first of all, you know, as many of you know already, that uh, nowadays, you know, China is uh, you know number one trading partner of Japan, uh, far surpassing uh, our bilateral trade between you know, US and Japan. And Japan has been one of the top investors you know, in China as well. Uh, many Chinese intellectuals, although they wouldn't say it in public, but priva privately they admit without massive you know, investment coming from Japan or technology transfer, or yen loan provided by the Japanese government, Chinese economy would not have grown this fast, this big. So right now, you know, these two, you know, giant economy, Chinese economy and Japanese economy are closely intertwined. I think the same could be said about U.S. economy, you know, with the Chinese economy. So nobody, you know, including U.S. or Japan wants trade war with China. But what we do want is to see China act in accordance with international law or trade agreement. 
Here, you know, we are beginning to see some encouraging signs. These days, China, even if they lost WTO cases, panel cases, or upper body cases, they do not make a big fuss out of this. Big difference from their reaction to this arbitration ruling on the South China Sea. So at least in trade and investment fields, they are beginning to accept the rule of law, which is encouraging. But we need more than that. So here we need joint efforts, joint efforts by US and Japan <coughs> to call on our Chinese colleagues to be a good student of international law. That is my take. Thank you. Um, I think we're ready to take questions from the floor. I believe there is a microphone. Um, if you could um, identify yourself uh, before your question, that would be very helpful. Are there any questions? Oh, no questions. Yes. Thank you. My name is Jimmy Nguyen from Voice mm -hmm. of Vietnamese Americans. And uh, from your point of view, uh, Dr. Yama Yami, uh, what do you think the, the people of Japan would like to see happen? Because Prime Minister Abe has expanded his uh, level, uh, his power m many, many times trying to push the constitution of Japan very far, I would think. And given now, with the current economy uh, situation in Japan, would that afford Japan to step up and respond to all the demand that the president elect Trump may put on as sh burden sharing? So there was a thinking that Japan may just take the lead in the Trans-Pacific Partnership with 11 members, U.S. excluded, until Trump is able to join. Would that be possible? And I think the President of Malaysia and also Southeast Asia are very much hoping that Prime Minister Abe can talk to President Trump to promote TPP would that be on the table? Would that be something that Prime Minister Abe would do? And do you think if that is uh, potentially supported by everyone, um, you included in that in that scenario? Mm -hmm. Would um, Jeffrey, you from the Sasakawa, and I, I'm sure that Admi, um, Admiral Blair has a lot to do with the security issue. Do you think that um, there is a briefing with um, pr the new president-elect regarding the whole scenario or the, 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 the reality of trade and security between U.S. and Japan? Because from his um, campaign, it seems like he's lacking a few pieces of reality. So do you think that he has adequate information and is there a process that we will brief him, give him all the necessary pieces so that he can make informed decision in time, <coughs> not too late? Thank you. That's a lot. <laughs> Yamagami Fung, do you want to start? Well, uh, uh, thank you for the questions. First of all, you know, uh, on you know, uh, Japanese domestic politics, uh, Yes, it is true that uh, you know Japan is now enjoying unusual political stability. Remember, we used to have six one-year prime ministers in a row. Uh, so, what a stark change, you know, uh, from that time, and uh, with the extension of uh, you know uh, 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 his term as uh, you know president of uh, Liberal Democratic Party. There are some political pundits you know, who would say Abesa might be able to stay in office until September of year 2021. You know, if that materializes, you know, he will uh, make the greatest, you know, longest serving prime minister in Japanese history. Mm. And that is going to be quite, quite unprecedented. 
but uh, not uh, only of uh, you know uh, duration of uh, you know his term, but because of the productivity of this administration, I think uh, it is quite uh, you know worthwhile to mention this because uh, this administration has come up with a lot of uh, you know policy you know, policy initiatives. Uh, from my personal viewpoint, you know, uh, achievement in diplomacy is quite <coughs> impressive. And uh, this Prime Minister Abe seems to like uh, his engagement in, uh, you know, striking, uh, working a uh, good relationship with countries concerned. One example is uh, when member foreign dignitaries come to Tokyo, you know, he almost makes the, it a rule to entertain the dignitaries with either lunch or dinner on top of bilateral meetings uh, in office. You know, <coughs> for many Japanese diplomats, this is a dream coming true. <laughs> Prime Minister is doing this much. So no wonder the number of dignitaries visiting Tokyo is on remarkable increase. So <laughs> He goes to the food. Oh, <laughs> well, well, <laughs> Japanese food also. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, I think, uh, you know, we would like to see this trend, you know, uh, continued. And uh, as for your question about constitutional reform, this is a highly political question, but the Japanese public opinion is quite interesting to watch. And uh, I think according to the recent opinion poll, uh, <coughs> People, you know, who want to see constitutional reform, and people uh, who wanna, you know, just maintain the existing provisions of the constitution, you know, basically is the same number. Uh, so, you know, uh, it will require a, a lot of debates, and I'm quite sure Prime Minister and the people around him uh, will be, you know, uh, very, very cautious. Uh, in proceeding uh, uh, on uh, their path. But uh, e remarkable you know, thing to be noticed is uh, since the enactment, and uh, this constitution has never been amended, which is quite unusual. Yeah. And the time has changed. So there are a number of people who say we need to sort of, you know, uh, revise certain provisions of the constitution so that it can more accommodate mm -hmm. uh, the demands uh, of the current time. Finally, on TPP, uh, personally speaking, you know, uh, because of the reasons I mentioned uh, before, I wouldn't uh, want to see TPP go ahead without U.S. participation. U.S. has been a magnet of this trade deal. U.S. has a lot to offer in terms of huge market and resources. But at the same time, U.S. has a lot to gain from this trade agreement as well. And uh, also, as I said, this is not <coughs> a mere trade agreement. There is a strategic significance attached to it. So after, you know, careful, you know, considerations and domestic debates, hopefully, you know, uh, I think uh, we can put U.S. on board. Let's move ahead. That is my message. <laughs> but thank you for your questions. <laughs> well, to, to answer the question about briefing, Jap is a briefing necessary, but also, I, I let me start with that. Yes, a briefing on Japan, of course, is necessary, uh, and I'm, he, he will get many briefings on every country and every region, um, and it, there's a process in place for that with transition teams and different agencies that will provide that, so that's, that's not, a, not an issue. Um, but I wanted to address the question that you actually um, asked Yamagami-san about burden sharing, um, because burden sharing is not, it's not just economics. Um, now, in the transaction costs that the candidate Trump used to talk about, um, it was we need our allies to pay more. But there's also burden sharing in terms of doing more and, and, and missions and roles. And so there is here 
there is room in Japan's legal structure to do more on current missions. Japan right now has one PKO in South Sudan. And a, a, a cabinet decision on Tuesday now allows for the engineering units to uh, rush and protect um, civilians that come under attack. But there's nothing illegal about Japan sending infantry units to other parts of the country to do that. So right now you have engineering units that are essentially protected, uh, although it's, there, it's in a stable area, but you have other infantry units from many, many other countries that are there. Um, and so technically right now the Japanese ground self-defense forces will only rush and protect civilians after the, the, new, the new mission goes. It's a political decision not to send infantry units to provide that. So they can do that. Um, there's also the, f the fight against ISIS. Um, Japan in the war against Afghanistan provided refueling mission for allies doing sorties into Afghanistan. Um, if Japan wanted to, they could go to rear areas, Turkey, air bases in Turkey, or even put oilers in the Mediterranean. They could provide uh, fuel for allied planes fighting ISIS. Um, not doing it, it's, it's again, it's a political decision. It is legal, you can do that. So the, these are not necessarily putting Japanese forces into combat roles, which is the big, y there's a big issue about that obviously still, but it's just um, sort of looking at what laws are on the books and what can be done. Um, but I must add that when you talk about burden sharing and renegotiating sort of the terms of the alliance, it's a two-way street. And that's something that I don't think has been fully thought out because Japan for many years have, they've wanted different aspects of the status of forces agreement changed. And if you have here uh, a president that says we want to renegotiate our alliance, uh, Japan is 100% in its right to say, great, we want to put the sofa on the table and we want to renegotiate aspects of the status of forces agreement, which would be if you talk to people at, at DOD, um, that's not something they, they necessarily want to do. Um, so it's a two-way street here. If you start saying you want to renegotiate aspects of the alliance, there's, it's not just Japan change. The U.S. would have to give and take as well. Um, I want to stay on this topic of Japan taking on a bigger role, but look into um, areas that go beyond the military and I'm also struck by Yamagami-san's noting that there is stability in the Japanese political arena right now that ironically from a revolving door of um, Japanese leaders, it, it does provide that anchor of stability in an increasingly unstable Japan. Now, can Japan under, under that strong leadership on the one hand, and the world facing so much turmoil, um, questioning um, the international liberal order, questioning issues about freedom of, not just of freedom of, of uh, exchange of goods and services, but also people. We, we have questions about migration, we have questions about populations. Can Japan play a bigger role in things like climate change, like human rights, at a time when I believe that the Trump administration will not be as active, if at all active, in those areas. Does it have the will and does it have the credibility to be able to push those issues forward? Well, thank you, Shihoko-san. First of all, you know, Japan's, uh, you know, uh, response to these challenges against liberal, you know, international order. I think, uh, you know, uh, the record speaks for itself. You know, Japan is one of the uh, few Asian countries uh, that joined, you know, sanctions, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis these incidents uh, in Crimea and Ukraine. And Japan was the vocal uh, supporters of the rule of law, freedom of navigation, freedom of overflight in the South China Sea. 
we have been continuously you know, told by our Chinese colleagues that uh, it's none of Japan's business to talk about South China Sea. So Japan should keep its mouth shut. We won't shut up because a lot is at stake for us as well. South China Sea constitutes important sea lanes of communication. More than 90% of Japan's import oil come through that body of water, more than 60% of natural gas. Supply chain of Japanese business is crisscrossing South China Sea. And uh, not only you know, based on those economic interests, but also because <coughs> of our desire to contribute to the maintenance of liberal rules-based international order. Uh, we have been quite active in this regard, along with United States and uh, such country as Australia and India. On your question, Shihoko-san, about Japan's you know, efforts uh, for climate change or human rights, I think uh, you know, both Japan and U.S. are looking at the same destination, same goals. Of course, you know, uh, we need to seriously tackle this issue of climate change. You know, we need to promote human rights. Uh, there is no question about it. But uh, from time to time, you know, you need to recognize the differences of specific approaches and uh, measures. For example, you know, when it comes to human rights, uh, Japan's approach is not necessarily, you know, uh, speak directly about it in the face of, you know, our counterparts. Sometimes, you know, we need to, you know, uh, show our deeds and behavior, and uh, we'd like to, you know, uh, lead by showing, you know, uh, our posture. You know, Myanmar was a great example. I know there certainly seemed to be a division of labor here, but finally, you know, Myanmar is proceeding in a desirable, you know, direction. So there are a lot of things, you know, we can do together, not necessarily by taking identical measures and actions, but by coordinating our measures in a proper and appropriate manner. That is my take. Um, one of the concerns um, that's being raised by the U.S. media is reports about um, how the current, uh, the incoming administration may deal with the Muslim population in the United States and that there may be um, a greater um, scrutiny of not just uh, people from Muslim countries coming into the United States, but also perhaps of identifying those of um, uh, with an Islamic faith um, in the United States. And, and that has always been compared um, with um, the American experience during World War II in interning Japanese Americans and singling them out and um, ostracizing them. And that experience puts Japan in a very unique position. Would, would you say that Japan would have, the government of Japan today would have something of value to add on America, possible, this is so speculative, but um, policies that the United States may or may not take about identifying specific racial groups? I think, uh, you know, you touched upon an important issue, and uh, yes, uh, you know, uh, every, you know, let me put it this way, every mature country has its dark chapter or dark pages in its history. And uh, as a former resident of this country, as somebody who went to graduate school in this country, I'm uh, you know, more than confident that the United States has adequate capacity to face up to those dark chapters, dark pages, and you know, uh, quite appropriately you know, rectify some wrongdoings. That is what exactly took place when it came to treatment of Americans of Japanese descent, you know, during the Second World War. And uh, I think same could be applied, you know, to the treatment of, you know, Muslim population 
Yes, the United States is a country enjoying freedom of speech. There will be a lot of discussions, pros and cons, but at the end of the day, I'm confident that the uh, United States uh, government and American people you know, will reach a good judgment. I have no doubt about it. Thank you. Hi, Manny Manrique is Japan Automobile Manufacturers Association. Hi, Shihoko. Thank you for Hi. organizing this, and it's really a uh, pleasure to, to have you both here uh, speaking on this issue. Um, <coughs> in trying to forecast what a Trump administration might do on Asia policy and uh, its approach to Japan, I think you know we're we're all quite busy looking at the potential appointments to to his cabinet, <laughs> um, and uh, you know. I guess my question is, how hopeful are you? And uh, do you see any uh, positive or, I suppose, negative signs as well um, in terms of the folks that are currently uh, meeting in, in Trump Tower mm -hmm. and uh, apparently being vetted for, for some key positions in the cabinet? Well, I have uh, lived long enough uh, not to have too high expectation uh, or not to, you know, give up on life. So <laughs> I'm pretty neutral. And uh, after all, life goes on. You know, every four years, you know, you have a new tenant in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. I do recall, you know, some years ago, you know, there was, uh, you know, president-elect, you know, coming into the White House publicly you know, declaring he would like to see U.S. forces in Korea withdrawn. But look at what happened thereafter. So you know, I am cautiously you know, optimistic about the near future of U.S.-Japan alliance. Certainly, U.S. needs Japan. Japan needs U.S. Without your military presence, you know, on the Japanese archipelago, it would be very, very difficult for U.S. to, you know, keep its leadership or keep credibility of U.S. security assurances provided not only to Japan, but also to other Asian allies. So hopefully, you know, new administration will, you know, come to, uh, you know, uh, what we expect them to do. But in order to do that, we need joint efforts. We need to update the new administration <coughs> as to the current status of our alliance, joint work, and they need to listen to us. So this kind of two-way street dialogue is pretty important. In that regard, the New York meeting, you know, this afternoon could be you know, very, very good step forward. But thank you for your questions. <laughs> if I could tackle that too, um, I guess there's two ways of looking at it: the the team that he's assembling, as well as the the career bureaucrats and uniformed officers that are on the U.S. And so I start with the latter first. Having worked in in a DoD organization for five years, I know what the view is across the DOD, across the services on Japan, and it's extremely positive. And so the minute that he sits down um, with, when he has a team, he sits down, it's going to be nothing but positive things from the DOD side, from the services side in regards to Japan as an ally, in regards to U.S. forces in Japan. Um, so there's confidence there that Regardless of who he assembles from a political side as an advisor, you're going to have a very strong uh, career uniformed approach of State Department, DOD, services. They're all going to say Japan is vital. It's strategically important. It should be the center of our efforts in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, that's why I'm very confident in, in that regard. But the, in terms of the team, everybody knows here about the Republicans that have basically said they'll never work for Trump. There has been some weakening in that. Um, the, on, in the public domain, if you look at the information, the only two names that I saw in the public domain that 
were encouraging from an Asia perspective, but again, it's just rumor, mm -hmm. um, was Randy Shriver and Rich Armitage. And the Armitage one is the most surprising, and that was actually rumored as Secretary of State, uh, which the reason why that's so surprising is that he publicly came out and said, not only will I not endorse Trump, but I will vote for Hillary. And so it, if, if uh, President Trump actually welcomed Armitage onto a team in that high level, that would show that he's not being vindictive. Um, but again, it is all rumor. That is just things that are coming out on Politico or CNN about, uh, <laughs> if, if you look at CNN, they actually have a running, if you can find it, there's a, there's a tab that they have of running rumors. And the Secretary of State right now, Armitage is on there, but he's one of like seven people who are rumored. And obviously we don't have seven secretaries of state, so <laughs> at least six of those are wrong, maybe seven. Um, so at this point, it's way too early. Uh, but I can also say from private conversations, people who I look to as solid up and down uh, uh, Asia experts, up and down Japan experts, none of them have are signing on uh, at this juncture. But there is a weakening, I would say, among some. Yes. If I may expand on the points made by Jeffrey, I mean, importance of inputs from civil servants and uniform people. I fully agree with that point. And uh, well, uh, when I was stationed in London until five years ago, and one of my favorite TV programs was Yes, Prime Minister. <laughs> you might have seen it, you know. I mean, every some years, you know, new prime minister, you know, comes to Downing Town, but there are these civil servants who are so adamant in, you know, maintaining status quo, and they don't hesitate to give advice to new coming prime minister. Maybe what we need right now is American version of yes, prime minister. Well, you know, somebody should come forward and to brief the importance of U.S. ally, you know, your alliance with allies in the Asia Pacific. I think that can be done, but that can be done by U.S. officials as well as by Japanese government. Thank you. Um, more questions? All right. Well. Um, Many people are functioning better with fear. Well, I mean, my personal view, I don't think presenting a worst scenario is constructive. Um, because a worst scenario is, you name it. It could be, it could be anything. Uh, I, I think at this point, regardless of, of if you voted for Trump, if you voted for Hillary, um, as a president of the United States, you want the president to succeed. And so I think it's constructive to look in terms of the best case scenario, hoping that from the standpoint of, of American citizen, from Japanese citizen, um, we want the best for the alliance. And so that's why I, I'd rather stick at the best, best uh, option approach because the worst option approach could, could be anything. If I might respond you know, in my own way and in general terms, I think the worst scenario uh, will be U.S. out of the game. Last week, uh, you know, I was discussing with, uh, you know, counterparts from uh, China and uh, South Koreans. One constant message, you know, coming from our colleagues in Beijing was, now let's decide about Asia among Asians. Now that we may have a peculiar politician or peculiar president coming into office. Is that what the United States want? U.S. will be out of Asia Pacific. I think that is going to be a nightmare for many responsible policymakers in Washington. And, you know, we, including Japan, does want U.S. presence, U.S. role to be played, you know, further actively. So I think that is going to be a choice you have to face. So for you and for Jeffrey, do you see that in Britain going to be a particular action 
is not enough. If the message is not enough, if the perception is not enough, so obviously from where? You know, from the the message has to not being from my heart itself. And that you can see that that the nirvana is that is that going over there and sending the message. But we need that to have enough because they are led to going to leave the body. <coughs> so there's more to do that we need to come up with more things. Body religion is one thing, and the whole United States, and if we can get a week to party, everybody has a week to message to say to say I, I love you. It and I'm not sure if that message is being sent out adequately. Well, I I can say that you have from a, from a from a think tank realm. I can say when I talk to my I was just in Japan a couple weeks ago. When I talk to my my Japanese friends in uh, MOD and MOFA in the armed services there, they know f from talking to other think tankers that uh, the U.S.-Japan relationship is still extremely important, um, and that the rhetoric that a lot of the rhetoric that was on the campaign does not reflect the predominant view amongst people who actually focus on the alliance every day, uh, as Yamagami-san said. A lot of the rhetoric was 1970s, 1980s rhetoric. Uh, everybody else has been slapping high fives for the last year, saying this is the best the alliance has ever been. Um, and that message is getting across. Uh, you have State Department folks, DOD folks. I, I can just speak in my little section of the, of the government, but I'm sure the same thing is happening in commerce, treasury, energy, across the board. Uh, you have that communications from a uh, civil servant level and from an armed services level. Uh, reassuring, because you're right, Mr. Trump, although he will be president, he's just one person. And as I said at the beginning, when he becomes President Trump, there's suddenly a bunch of other domestic actors that have veto opportunities in the governing process. You also have global events, regional events. Everything starts to change. Think about the Bush administration. He didn't come in saying, I'm going to fight a war on terror, but 9-11 changed his administration completely to having to focus on terrorism. And so who knows what a President Trump will encounter in his first year in office and how that's going to affect his, his, uh, his governing and his priorities. Um, but I do think that there is a lot of messaging that's happening at the lower levels. And what will be interesting and, and, and play off the previous question is just keeping watch of who fills the positions. Now, the, the top positions, yes, they're important. But when you start to go deeper into the, the, the real the desk officers, and, or not maybe the desk officers, but who's filling in the deputy assistant positions? Who's really filling in those positions that are sort of manning and, and giving directives to the desk officers, and who's giving advice to the, the upper, upper uh, people? That's going to be important because that's going to show you, are the experts, are the Japan hands finding positions in the government in different places? Uh, are the Asia hands? Are the, you know, the are the people who are hard on China, soft on China? Who's getting those positions? That that's not going to be reported on CNN. You might have to dig deeper into like more wonkish um, articles, but you it will be out there, and that will be uh, important. But I do think at this point that message is being sent very loud and clear to uh, Tokyo that the alliance is extremely important to the United States. And. Yeah, and a message that really does need to be sent strongly at this stage is to say that it is actually in the United States self interest to remain a Pacific power. That it isn't it isn't acting on altruistic reasons. That it is in its own interest that for the past seventy years the order, international order that America has been such a a key player in establishing, it has worked to the United States' favor, and it, it is in the United States' favor to in, ensure that that continues. But it also needs, the other message that we need to deliver is that other countries have interests too. And there is a d shift in the balance of power in Asia right now, and it's accommodating those various interests and the, the degree of the rest of Asia rising and being able to work together for this common objective. That, and, and that message might not necessarily be, be delivered in an effective way. So, um, yes. Thank 
Okay, th thank you very much. The, uh, so I, th I think my question is a little similar to his question, but uh, I'm very glad to uh, attend this very lively and uh, very timely event today. And I'm Asuka Matsumoto, the now the visiting scatter at uh, the site, and, uh, and the previous is uh, working for JIA, JIIA as a research fellow. But and uh, uh, Jeffrey mentioned that Trump might change his uh, foreign, poli uh, foreign policy promise and uh, when he becomes president. And uh, also the, uh, the ambassador Yamagami mentioned even Trump's rhetoric was uh, like uh, 80s or 90s. But I've heard like uh, that Trump was currently or, or already the surprise when he knew that Japan covered host, host nation support by more than 75% and Japanese companies in the US are creating the jobs, a lot of jobs for American people actually. So also as a, as Ambassador Yamagami mentioned, now like White House and uh, President Obama are briefing for Trump, and uh, also the, I hope that like, uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, can tell the Japanese president future contribution to the, the future president Trump. But what kind of things can Japan do to let like uh, Trump and uh, Trump supporters uh, like uh, to, how to say understand Japan-U.S. relations after like today's dialogue? Like uh, such as more like public diplomacy or, or people to people people to people exchange like adding to or like uh, military and the civil cooperation or governmental briefing itself because the Trump phenomenon was not only just Trump but also like uh, based on mass movement. So just I'd like to. If I may respond, you know, uh, uh, no, I. I find you know this message make America great again. Uh, very very interesting. I know as somebody I know who has lived and uh, you know lived in the states and worked with uh, Americans uh, for more than thirty years in the foreign service. To me, America is already great. <laughs> but at the same time, you know when he says making America great again. This could mean a lot. This could include a lot of meanings, uh, not only you know uh, in terms of economic performance, but also this could mean you know strong America, militarily, and uh, that may you know uh, work well for you know allies in the Asia uh, Pacific. So in that regard, again, yes, there is an element of unpredictability, but uh, at the same time, there are a lot of potentials to be achieved you know, jointly. And uh, as I said, life goes on, and uh, we need to work you know, uh, jointly you know, for the betterment of our alliance and for the interests of both countries. I mean, in, in terms of the things that you said, public diplomacy is always a plus. Uh, Japanese Honda and Toyota here in the United States, they, em they employ a lot of American workers. And um, if, if I'm sure at some point when, now that the campaign's over, when you start to sit down and talk about individual countries, I don't know what he, kno what he knows and what he doesn't know. You're saying that he, he doesn't know those certain things. But it's now a, a steep learning curve uh, to learn about all these aspects of countries he was criticizing on the campaign trail and what is fact and what is not fact. Um, but uh, for Japan, uh, for those of us who follow Japan, yes, it's, it's, it's public knowledge that Japanese companies produce a lot of American jobs. And that even if, if you, you, there's, Cars that are that are created here that you know, people will buy. They oh, let's not buy a Toyota because that's a Japanese car. Well, it also creates a lot of workers for. And if that's the priority of a President Trump, then uh, having that knowledge is is valuable. Um, so public diplomacy is helpful, but at the end of the day, I'm not I, I'm not a public diplomacy expert, so I don't know like how to target that or how actually the beneficial it is from a monetary standpoint to put a lot of money into that as opposed to just having briefings to say this is what the facts are. Um, uh, but the communities, I, I used to teach at the Ohio State University, Columbus, Ohio, and there's a very large plant 
close to Columbus. Everybody in Columbus knows the importance of those jobs. So uh, for the communities that uh, work uh, uh, from Japanese plants that get work from, they know. It's, it's common knowledge. Um, we're going to take one last question. <coughs> no, no, uh, to the gentleman. Thank you. Um, John Lawrence, I'm a member of Dickinson Wright from Detroit. Uh, Ambassador Yamagami, I wanted to ask probably an unfair question. Um, you mentioned in your remarks that you regarded it as an important step that Prime Minister Abe is meeting with Mr. Trump today. Given your long experience of Prime Minister Abe and his background, uh, the unfair part is I don't know the extent to which you've studied Mr. Trump in his background, uh, but do you, how would you estimate the probability that those two gentlemen from what I regard as extremely different backgrounds will create a relationship that will be mutually beneficial for our two countries? Hmm. Well, that's uh, not at all an unfair question, and I think that's a legitimate question. And uh, I am uh, kind of hopeful because, you know, having looked at, uh, you know, this prime minister for quite some time, he has been really skillful in terms of cultivating personal relationship with his, you know, overseas counterparts. Uh, for example, look at his relationship with uh, uh, Prime Minister of India, Modi. Uh, look at his relationship with Prime Minister of Mongolia or President of Turkey, and uh, even President of Russia. Uh, so, you know, uh, when it comes to personal chemistry, uh, I have no doubt in his, you know, capacity to strike a good uh, personal working uh, relationship. And uh, yes, some people would say, you know, uh, President-elect could be transactional, he's commercially oriented, he's, uh, you know, uh, born to be a businessman. But uh, yes, you know, this prime minister is very, very pragmatic and realist. When you look at his, you know, performance in office, you know, in this regard, I have a different from, you know, opinion from some, you know, uh, Western media, uh, who used to describe this prime minister as, you know, right-wing hawk or revisionist. <coughs> the fact, you know, directs us into a different direction. So I am, you know, optimistic. And, uh, well, maybe, you know, it's high time for them to enjoy next round of golf together. <laughs> Well, on that happy note, we all have to go and watch TV and see the two men actually um, <laughs> uh, moving forward with that um, meeting. So thank you all so much for coming. And before we go, I hope you'll join me in thanking our two speakers. And hopefully this will be, uh, we will continue this dialogue as the administration establishes itself. So thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.